Hello everyone, welcome to the Pro MMA Betting Podcast. So we're going to break down the, the Tiago Santos Glover Texera card coming up tomorrow. As always, we'll work from the bottom of the card right the way up to the top of the card. Just a reminder about the service, guys. You can sign up to the picks. We have pre-betting tips that are emailed out to members every week. And we also run a live betting service on Discord. So we freeze the chat during the fights. Any tips where I feel there's value are sent out. I judge off of Bet365's odds. So whenever I send out a tip, it's based off what Bet365 are offering. But you can use uh, multiple books for live betting. Um, Bet Online, they're off a live betting. They've been doing it since the restart. They haven't been offering live betting during the rounds for the last couple of weeks because they had some kind of, well, they haven't disclosed what happened. I think it was some kind of, um, well, they did. They said it was a hacking issue. Um, but the, the guy I follow on Twitter, Dave Mason, said that from this Saturday they will have live betting back during the round, so that's good to hear. So Bet Online's a good one if you're American, and you've got multiple other books that offer live betting there. It's really popular. It's obviously a, a big income source for books, so they're pretty hot on it now. So, and it's normally a really easy way to make money. I've got to admit, since the COVID restart, live betting's not been as hot. Um, normally, I could pretty much guarantee every event I'd be walking away with some nice profit, but. There hasn't been as many spots for live bet I'm finding. I think partly due to the matchmaking, the UFC are just churning out card after card at the moment. They're making a lot of mismatches. There's a lot of fighters being brought in that you wouldn't normally see under the UFC banner. But Dana's got to put out, I think it's 42 shows in a calendar year to hit his agreement with ESPN. I think it's 42 shows, as I just said. So they're just kind of bringing in anyone. So it is resulting in a lot of mismatches. And obviously mismatches aren't good for live betting opportunities. We need competitive fights for, for the live betting to kick in. So I think that's partly affected it. So hopefully next year, once we get back to a normal schedule, I know they're already putting cards together for January and February, which is good. Um, lots of notice for fighters. And it, it means they're not going to have to bring in such low calibre guys and we should get more competitive fights. But we might just have to ride out the rest of this year with regards to live betting. But there's a link below this video um, to all of our trackers. We we track all the live bets, all the pre-bets. Trackers are there. They're also on the website, prommabetting.com. The packages are available on prommabetting.com. If you go to the website, you'll see them. Any questions, feel free to DM me. My Twitter is at prommabetting. You can also email me info at prommabetting.com. So bear in mind as well, guys, that with regards to betting, it is up and down. No one wins every week. It's uh, When you buy into the service, you've got to think long term. You've got to think like the stock market. There's peaks and troughs. We win some weeks, we lose some weeks. The aim is we win overall. Last year, guys that risk £100 per unit, $100 per unit, won £14,500 or dollars. If you're fully invested and you've taken the pre-bets and you're, you're jumping on board the live betting as well, uh, we offer live betting for boxing as well, sometimes some pre-bets. Normally the live betting for the boxing is for the UK shows because the UK shows are on before the UFC and the UFC follows. Normally the American boxing shows clash with the UFC and UFC gets priority. So lots and lots of opportunity available for betting, for pre-bets and for live betting. It's not just UFC, it is boxing. And I do cap the other shows as well, like LFA, Bellator, etc. That's a fairly new thing for me. Um, I've only really been getting deep into them cards probably the last month or so. I've really started capping them. So hopefully we can make some money on them. And like Cage Warriors has always been a, a big money winner for me over the years. But we'll jump into the card now. We'll start, as I said, from the bottom, work our way through. As I always say, this is a betting podcast, guys. I'm not just here to pick, oh, I think X fighter is going to win. I look at the value. I will pick a fighter based on the value if I think there is value on their betting line. This is a podcast tailored for bettors, not just for people who want to hear who they think is going to win a fight. I don't, I don't pick like that. If I've got a strong gut feeling... Even if I think there's value on a betting line, then I, I generally will still stick with my gut. But if I'm kind of undecided and I think there is value there, then I will pick the value side because 
It's what betting's about, and that's why I say it's long term because every underdog I pick isn't going to win. But what we need to look at is over a year. How many of these underdogs have won? What we don't need every underdog to hit. That's the beauty of betting underdogs. They don't all need to win because we're getting plus money. So you know, if you're betting a, a two to one underdog and you're doubling your you're doubling your stake, then beautiful. You only need to win, you know, two out of three, and you're in profit. So that is the beauty of betting underdogs. We don't need them all to win. Whereas if you are betting the favourites, you're parlaying the favourites, you need a really high strike rate to profit. If you're betting people that are like one to four, one to three, you know, you need to win four weeks in a row. You lose the fifth week, you're back to break even if you're betting these minus 400. So you, you've just got to manage the manage the two carefully. And that's why you've got to take a long-term view with the betting process because we're going to have weeks where the underdogs don't hit. But what you need to do is over the long-term period, you need to be profiting on some of these underdogs even you know depending on the, the lines but as i say you don't need to hit every one even if you're hitting one in three as long as the line's wide enough you're going to be making profit and you're running at a 33 percent pick rate you can still make profit as long as you're hitting the dogs and the line's wide enough so there's there's a great value in these underdogs but i have noticed the last few shows actually and including the Bellator show last night a lot of the favorites have been coming in lately there's not been many dogs hitting so do also bear in mind that favourites are favourites for a reason. They do generally tend to win. So you've, you've got to be careful picking your spots with the underdogs. But let's jump into the card. We'll start from the um, bottom, as I always say, work our way up. First fight on the card, we've got Gustavo Lopez taking on Anthony Bershak. Um, Anthony's coming in here on very short notice. He's been brought in this week. Second run in the UFC. We last saw him, I think it was back in 20, 2016. I think maybe was the last time we've seen, seen him in the UFC. Um, he's 34 years of age now. Um, he is a Zin Jiu Jitsu black belt, a wrestling background as well. Very short notice, under a week from looking at topology. He didn't have a fight lined up, so I wonder what kind of shape he is in. Also to note, he's not been past round one in three years. So this is potentially going to be his first fight that's going to go past round one in three years. And he's in on very short notice here. Doesn't bode well. He did slow down in the last fight that went three rounds. He lost a, a split decision over in Rising to a, uh, a journeyman Japanese fighter with a, or Korean fighter with a losing record. He's ruled off three wins in a row since, but against very, very substandard opposition. Lopez, you guys will probably be familiar against Mirab Devashidi. He came in on a very short notice, similar to what Anthony's done here. And I mean he got dominated for the three rounds, but he went the distance. He you know, he put in a spirited display. I was I was you know, fairly impressed with him. He he, he seems like a guy that's happy to fight, he's always smiling in there, he comes to throw down. Got a nasty knockout win on combat before he made his UFC debut. And he also knocked out Jose Alde in their rematch. If you watch the first fight, he loses a split decision. And he was just kind of picked off from range against Alde. He didn't, wasn't aggressive enough. And in the rematch, just fights completely differently. Comes out aggressive. Clearly says he's not going to allow Alde to have the space that he did in the first fight. Just pressures him. Alde doesn't like it and knocks him out. He's clearly got power. Two nice knockout wins in a row before he got into the UFC. Um, trains at Extreme Couture. I actually, I haven't taped Anthony Bershak here. I'm just going off memory with regards to his previous run in the UFC. And I know he slowed down in that last rising fight he had. His run in the UFC didn't go great either. He went, but he went two and two. But, you know, I'm not surprised UFC let him go. He lost to Ian Entz, we saw. He got knocked out by Thomas Almeida. He got a good win over Joe Soto in round one. And then he got a split decision win over Danilo Lopez. So, you know, two and two and a split decision in his last fight against a guy that's not UFC caliber. It's, it's no surprise they let him go. And then he went on a rough spell in rising. He didn't cut the mustard in the UFC. He didn't cut the mustard in rising. And now he's been brought back in his short notice. But Lopez isn't high value, isn't 
a high caliber fighter, but I, I have to go with Lopez here. He's the guy that's had the full tank, uh, the full camp. He's the guy that career seemed, you know, their careers seem to be going in different directions. Lopez, you know, he's he's going to be hungry here. He's got his first shot in the UFC, whereas Bershak, it, it just feels like it's the last chance saloon for him. Very short notice. It just seems the cards are stacked against him. I actually took Lopez. Bet Online opened Lopez. I don't know if they opened it at this, but I saw him on Bet Online at plus 145, and I, I took it with that, doing any Bershak tape. It's only, you know, I've got $500 on it. So when you work it out in pounds, it's it's under £400, so it's like a 0.4 unit bet for me. But I'm happy letting that ride. I had in my head that this should be a, a pick em at worst, if not Lopez, a slight favourite. And it, it seems like Lopez is probably going to close the slight favourite, I would have thought. So I'm happy to let that ride. I don't think there's any value now. Lopez isn't, as I said, a, a, a world-class fighter. This you know, this could go either way. But I do feel the cards are stacked against Bershak here. And the longer the fight goes, I think it definitely favours Lopez. He can bang. Um, he fights at a decent pace. Um, if he brings the pressure like he did in that rematch with Alde, and even like he did against Marab, you know, he he brought the fight to Marab. He was just he just got out wrestled, um, as does everyone that fights Marab. So I'm going to pick Lopez there, um, but I don't think there's any value now on the line. I think if you've got that plus number on Lopez, I think it's a decent bet, but Pickham kind of feels about right to me, to be honest. Next fight, we've got Max Griffin taking on Ramiz. Brahimaj, hope I'm saying that right. So Ramiz was scheduled to make his UFC debut a little while ago. I did tape on him when he was scheduled to make his original UFC debut. I haven't gone back and done tape here because I remember when I done the tape on him, he, he was there was a lot of holes there. Um, a very explosive guy dangerous in round one but someone that just tends to kind of slow down down the stretch now we've not seen him compete in about 18 months he's a young guy he's training at 40s so the griffin line does feel appealing but at the same time you know a young guy 18 months out trains at 40s clearly very gifted athletically I don't really want to get involved in betting against him here because I would not be shocked if he comes out and looks a lot better. And you see it a lot, a lot of times. These guys come from the regional scene into the UFC and they look a hell of a lot better than they did on the regional scene. And I would not be shocked to see that here. And Max Griffin is someone that's just on my list of guys that I just can't bet him as a favourite. Um, you look at his UFC record and... You know, he could easily be 0-5. I mean, he got the majority decision over Zaleem, but I thought that was a draw. You know, the point deduction meant it was a draw. Without the point deduction, he lost that fight for me. And, you know, you know the fights are competitive. Thiago Alves fight was competitive, and he, he, he probably should have got that decision. But, you know, he lost to Alex Morono, the Alex Oliveira fight. He... You know, again, competitive, but he still came up short. You know, his best performance was against Mike Perry, where he fought long, kept him at range, and and boxed him up. And I think that should be the strategy here. Ramiz, based on the tape, he's going to come out and he's going to try and ground Griffin. But Griffin's strategy should just be don't engage in the grappling, just keep the fight long, use your length. He's got some power as well. You know, he, he fought really well against Mike Perry. He had some smart boxing, but... I just, I just don't trust the guy as a favourite. I just can't do it. Um, before that, he lost to Zaleski. He got a nasty beat down from Colby Covington. So, yeah, I just don't know where, where Griffin's at, just with all them losses. And I don't know what Ramiz is going to look like here with the layoff being at a good camp. You know, you've got to think he's going to come out and fight a bit more measured. And I can just see it being a typical Max Griffin fight where it's very close and very competitive. Um, Griffin's very tough to put away. I think Colby's the only guy to stop him, and that was more of a mercy stoppage. So Ramiz needs to be careful here because it's unlikely he's going to put Griffin away in round one. So he's definitely got to watch his cardio. He's definitely got to fight measured. I'm going to pick Griffin, but as I say, I, I don't know if there's any value because I just don't know what Ramiz is going to look like after this long layoff. So I can't, 
confidently say here that I think there's value on Griffin. Um, the line has been coming down. I think he's at about minus 140 now. A quick look. Yeah, minus 140, but I just don't know what version of Ramiz we're going to get here. So the pick is Griffin, but it's not a confident pick, and I wouldn't recommend laying money here because Griffin, for me, is just not a guy I can trust as a favourite, and we don't know what version of Ramiz we're going to get. But it's definitely an interesting fight. I'm looking forward to it. Um, just looking as well, if we've got measurements for Ramiz, because I imagine Griffin's going to have a... He's got a 3-inch reach advantage, but... So not huge, but it's still useful. But the plan for him should be, I think he should approach his, like the, the Perry fight. He's going to obviously have to fend off more takedowns than he did against Perry. But stuff to take down, escape from the clinch and fight long would be the strategy here. Let, let's see if he, he follows that. MMA is, fight IQ is so big, especially when you're, you're betting on this stuff. You want to you wanna trust your fighter. You want to know they're going to do what they should be doing what they've always done on tape and you know the best will in the world you've always you're always going to have guys that you bet and they just go out and you think what, what are they doing it's just it's just one of those things unfortunately that we have to work around with betting on MMA is just bad bad fight IQ next fight on the card we have Darren Elkins Eduardo Garagori Look, Darren Elkins should win this fight. There's a clear path to victory for him. Eduardo Garagori is clearly not a good wrestler. Um, he's susceptible to takedowns. We've seen it in both of his UFC fights. But Darren Elkins is getting to the end of the, the road. He's coming off a number of losses. I think he's four losses in a row now. Look, he's, look he has been against good competition, and you can argue he won his last fight. But the guy is, you know, he's taken a lot of damage. He's got so much scar tissue. And I, I just don't know how much longer he's, he's got left. You know, he's, he's, the fights he's in are normally pretty tough. And he's, you know, he's taken some beatings. I know that last fight was close and he could have nicked the decision, but he took a lot of damage in that fight. You know, Ryan Hall was rocking him all over the place. Ricardo Lamas stopped him. He got hurt against Volkanovski numerous times. You know, there's only so much damage you can take. And, you know, I'd like him to, I think if he wins this fight, I'd like him to call it a day because, you know, he's getting up there in age now. He's taking more damage. His face is a mess after every fight. And he's got a good stylistic fight here. Garagori, he's got decent stand-up. If you said to me this fight would be on the feet for three rounds, then Garagori would have a, a good chance of winning. But you've got to think Elkins is going to come in with a, a grapple heavy approach here so with a clear path to victory I I don't really see a, you know Elkins is as I said I think he's on the downward slope he's regressions, regressing so I wouldn't be shocked to be lost but at the same time I, I can't pick and say there's a value on Garagori because the wrestling is a clear issue for him but at the same time Elkins isn't really a finisher so Wilkins is probably going to have to grind this out for three rounds. And if the longer you're in there, the more chance you can get caught, etc. But I'm, I'm picking Elkins, but I don't think there's value on the line. People are, money's starting to come in and people are probably parlaying him, but not for me. Not for me. I think it's probably going to be more competitive than maybe it looks, especially with Elkins not really being a finisher. But I will go Elkins, but I just don't see any value on the line, and I'm just not overly enticed into playing Garagori because I, I can just see him getting taken down pretty easily. And just if you've bet him, just be in one of them fights where you come away saying he could have won it, but his takedown defence is awful. And you know, if you're getting taken down by Humberto Bandana, it's not a great look. So the pick is Elkins, but tread carefully, guys, because he is at the end of the road, and you know, he's lost four in a row, yes, against higher competition, but. Just minus two fifty on Darren Elkins is not appetising at all to me, but I am going to pick him here. Next fight, we've got heavyweight division. This should be a um, barnstormer as long as it lasts. We've got Romanov taking on Lima. Romanov, Moldovan. Wrecked everyone on the, the kind of Eastern European scene, came into the UFC, late notice replacement 
opponent Martinez just tore him apart, suplexed him all over the place, smashed him on the ground, fight could have been stopped earlier than it was, eventually got a submission in the second round, Martinez, fair play to him, he took a, he took a, a beating in that fight, De Lima, been in UFC a long time now, alternates wins and losses, never gets out of round one hardly, big power, but he's a good hammer but a terrible now, you know, if he doesn't get you out of there quickly, the guy likes to tap the mat, he's all four off of his back, he doesn't like being the now, um, so I think, you know, you've everyone's probably got the same view on this fight, De Lima either catches Romanov early or Romanov takes him down and pounds him out or submits him, and I don't sway from that consensus, that's how I see the fight going, um, I mean, this fight was originally matched up for Romanov for Romanov's UFC debut, and the odds were, I mean, they opened, and De Lima was a uh, the favourite. Um, the lines did kind of switch, but I think Romanov switched to a slight favourite, and then De Lima pulled out, and that's why Martinez came in. But now you've got Romanov, a massive favourite. Now I think Romanov wins here, but guys, it's minus 400 now, be very careful parlaying that up, you know, 80% win rate, this is the heavyweight, and it's, you know, it's lower level uh, heavyweight fight, I, I just be careful Romanov doesn't put a stunt here, because the Lima is dangerous on the feet, um, Romanov's never really faced any adversity, you know, how does he react, you know, I'm saying that the Lima's a bad now, what was Romanov like when he gets here, he might be a, he might be a terrible now himself, so I'd, I'd just be very careful now. You know, it was holding at around the minus 300 mark. But, you know, as we're getting closer to the fight day, people are parlaying Romanov up. But I expect him to win here. I'm not going to pick the Lima just because I'm not. I've kind of got a strong gut feeling that the Lima is going to get taken down. And like I said, he's not very good with adversity. And I just see him getting pounded out. So I, I am picking Romanov. But... I don't think there's any value there, guys. Um, I did like the under one and a half. Um, I kept it before the lines came out, and I kept it at about minus 230, which means there's um, 70% chance that the fight ends under one and a half rounds. So if they fought 10 times, I'm projecting that seven times out of 10, it would finish in one and a half rounds. The Lima's barely gone past one and a half rounds in the UFC. Um, Romanov's barely gone past one and a half rounds in his UFC career. On the feet, the Lima's probably got a big advantage. Um, he's got fast hands, he's got power. Um, he can knock Romanov out. And on the mat, as I've already said, the Lima isn't good off his back and he's a bit of a quit quitter. He, you know, he likes to tap that mat when he's getting adver facing adversity. So I, I think there's good reason to like the under there. I'd be surprised if it does go past, but the line is now, I mean, I said I kept it at minus 230 before the lines came out. It came out at about at minus 140. It's been bet down, no surprise there. And it's it's kind of bang at where I where I kept it. Most books seem to have it at about minus 220 now. I kept it at minus 230, so there's you know there's no value left now really on that. It's a bit, bit pricey now to pay that on a, an under one and a half because you've only got seven and a half minutes and you know I do feel it finishes under but betting is all about value at the end of the day and I think the value now has pretty much been eroded but I'm going to pick Romanov but I just wouldn't be going huge I mean Romanov might make this look easy but you've got to remember it's it is a lower level heavyweight fight and heavyweight fights there's big big um, that's the word I'm looking variance in heavyweight fights so you've got to be very you've got to be very confident if you're paying the juice here but I do I do think Robinov's gonna get some fancy belly to back suplex and just get on top and pound Lima out I don't think he's gonna take the beating that Martinez did next fight we've got oh god the flake the flake fest we have Bevan Lewis taking on... No, actually, I'm on the UFC website this week, guys, so the order should be correct. Actually, it's Giga Chikaze taking on Jamie Simmons. There's not much tape on Simmons. I had a look yesterday. I found a couple of his fights over pretty quick, so it's hard to get a read on him, but he's in on very short notice here. Giga Chikaze, 
is Stein's getting more comfortable in the octagon. We all know he's striking pedigree. Uh, the, I mean, the line reflects what the consensus is here. He's going to run through this Simmons guy. Um, I think the question on everyone's lips really is, he's a minus 800 favourite. Is, is he going to get the finish? Because that's what he's been lacking in the UFC. He's not been finishing guys. But to be fair to Giga, he's fought pretty durable guys. You know, the guys he's fought aren't easy to put away. And he did nearly stop... I can't remember the guy's name. Let me just bring up Giga's record. One second, guys. In his last fight, he did nearly stop Omar Morales in the third round. Um, a lot of guys would have got stopped there. Morales managed to tough it out. Owen Rivera took some big shots. Um, he's a tough guy. Jamal Emmers, you know, he's a pretty tough guy. Brandon Davis is durable. You know, so even though he's been fighting kind of lower level guys by the UFC standard, that they are durable guys at the same time. So, you know, we'll see. The other thing with Giga as well is he's quite kick heavy. So when you're when you're more of a kicker, it does it is going to reduce your your KO ratio because landing knockouts with kicks is a lot lower percentage than with your hands. Um, not saying he doesn't throw hands, he does, but he does. He's pretty kick heavy, and his hands are, you know. He's not the most refined striker with his hands. That you know, he's a little bit wild, so it's easier to see them coming. But I, I mean, I've, he's got. Uh, he should be putting Simmons away here. If he if he goes out and just wins a decision, you know, it's not doing him any favors. This guy's probably there for the taking. Um, you know, he, he got knocked out against Jake Childers in 13 seconds. Now, that's not necessarily a sign that he's chinny. I always say. That a lot of fighters get knocked out cold. It doesn't mean they're chinny. If you get knocked out early in a fight, it happens to the best of them. It, it's just I can't explain it physiologically, but for some reason, some guys do get caught cold, even if they've got really good chin. So I wouldn't overly read too much into that, but a couple of years ago as well, he was <clears throat> choked out by some O&O guy. So, you know, he's coming off wins over a couple of guys with winning records, but, they're, you know, they're still journeymen just going around the regional scene, fighting regular. You know, he's put them guys away, but Giga should be putting this guy away. So I'm going to go with Giga here, and um, what are the odds on Giga inside the distance? I wouldn't mess around with the over-under here. Personally, it's set at 1.5, but if it doesn't go to a decision, minus 200. Giga, what's Giga inside the distance? I mean, Giga KO... Minus one thirty doesn't seem bad. I did see on Bet Online yesterday they had Giga KO minus one twenty Giga inside the distance minus one thirty. I, I don't think that's bad. Let's just see what it is now. Giga inside the distance. It's been bet up a bit minus one fifty at Bet Online now. Minus one seventy at Dimes. He should be putting that guy away. I you know. I think if you can get under minus 200, I don't think it's a bad bet. I wouldn't go big because, like I said, Giga, you know, he hasn't been putting guys away, albeit this is his worst opponent in the UFC. So uh, he should put this guy away. It's a massive gulf of class on the feet here. Next fight, guys, we have... So this, sorry, this is the float fest. Trevin Giles, Bevan Lewis. I haven't done any tape on this fight because, as I said, it's a betting podcast. The reason I do tape, guys, is to bet. I, 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 if I'm taping a fight, it's because I want to make money on it, potentially. This fight is just a big no-no for me. I try and avoid betting on flakes. Um, I, I've said it for years now, I'm not going to bet flakes, but it's very hard to resist because sometimes you'll get a flake that will get matched up and it just seems like a great fight stylistically, but I'm <laughs> I'm very careful now, even if it's a good stylistic fight, about betting flakes that if they just... They, you know, it says it on the tin, they flake. Bevan Lewis' confidence is just completely shot since he got knocked out. Trevin Giles is just a guy I cannot trust at all. He lost to James Kraus. I remember uh, tipping on live bet. We got James Kraus. It must have been after round two at plus 500 on live bet. James Kraus clearly won round three for me. Clearly won round one. And he lost the split. And it was because... That Giles's ex BJJ coach was one of the judges, and he scored round one for Trevin Giles. Absolute disgrace. Can't remember his name, 
but that guy should be blackballed from judging MMA events, full stop. Ter I just don't know how you can give Giles round one. Yeah, he finished it pretty strong, but he Krauss was on his back for like four minutes. But yeah, Giles is liable to pull a stunt. Bevan Lewis is liable to pull a stunt. The line last time I looked was a pick em. It still is, I imagine, pretty much. There's no value there for me. I'm not even picking a winner here. I haven't got the foggiest. Um, I think Bevan Lewis, if he's... if he Look, I'll pick Bevan Lewis. If he's got any form of confidence back, he should win this fight. But if he's still stuck in that shell and worried about getting knocked out, I wouldn't be surprised if he loses. I personally think this is a stay away fight. From a betting angle, stay away. Two flakes. Who knows what one's going to gonna crumble first. So I will be completely passing on that fight, and I have no interest in doing any tape on that fight whatsoever. Next fight we have, so we're moving on to the main card now. Uh, five fight main card. First fight is Claudia Gadella taking on Yan. I'm not going to attempt to say her second name. You guys know I'm terrible at pronunciation, and I haven't got a clue how you say that. This is a really good fight. I went into tape thinking I was going to be betting Yan because I've been a bit on the wanting to fade Gadella for a while now. I definitely think she's a USADA victim. In fact, I'm 100, pretty much 100% confident that she's a USADA victim. She has adjusted her style as well. She doesn't, she used to just wrestle relentlessly. I um, mean, it would cost her cardio. She'd slow down, but normally she she'd have enough to grind out at least the first two rounds and, and win a decision. But she's adjusted her style now. She doesn't go as wrestle heavy. She is now with Mark Henry. You can see she's working on her stand up. She's got some faith in her stand up, and she will strike now. She will she will still try and grapple, but she she doesn't pursue it relentlessly. I think she's now aware that. It does cost her her cardio and it does cause her to slow down in fights. So she's trying to fight a lot cleverer. And her stand-up's not bad. You know, she hasn't got terrible stand-up. She's coming off that win over Angela Hill. I know it's highly contested, but I don't think it's a robbery. You know, and I went big on Angela Hill on live bet after round two because I thought, oh, it's Gadella. She's going to, she's definitely going to slow down here. Well, she is slowing down, it looked like. And, but round three, three was close. Um, you know, Gadella landed some big shots. She got outlanded volume-wise, but the, the biggest shots seem to come from Cla Claudia. So, who knows? Fight before that round of Marcos, she, she kept it standing. I mean, there was no real need to take Marcos down. She shot once in that fight. She was she, Marcos seemed very hesitant because of the takedown threat. Before that, Nina Ansarov, you know, success in round one with a takedown, but then you know, she got shut down and... You know, she just doesn't pursue the takedown relentlessly like she used to. The last time we really saw her go heavy with the takedowns was probably the Carla Esparza fight, and she slowed down in that fight. Um, I thought she won that fight. I didn't think the knockdown in round one was enough to give Carla that round because she got control pretty much the rest of the round. And, but she really did slow down in round three. And, you know, it's just a general thing for Claudia. But and like I said, against Hill, you know, the judges gave her the third round and it was competitive. It wasn't like she was blown out of her ass and non-competitive. She was competitive and her, her stand-up's clearly improving. Now, Yan is a beast on the feet. I don't see Claudia having much for her on the feet here. Yan is one of these, um, you know, she's kind of, you know, a bit similar to um, Welly Zhang in the sense that, you know, she's, she, she's very aggressive on the feet. She'll come out and throw a lot of volume. Um, she just try and overwhelm you. Now, you've got to be careful not overrating Yan, though, because she's coming off a great performance against Carolina, but Carolina is clearly a shot fighter, and I don't know if she's formally announced her retirement, but I expect her to be retiring. Before that, Angela Hill, that could have gone either way. I remember I bet Angela Hill there at plus 200 pre-fight, because I just thought that line was way too wide, and that fight, you can make an argument for Angela Hill there. Um, you know, before that, she beat Kondo, who just, you know, just proved she wasn't UFC worthy. Vivian Pereira's been cut. And you watch the Caden Curran fight, and, you know, that's a pretty competitive fight. And the unknown here is Jan's takedown defence, because against Curran, that's the last time you really get to see it. And the Curran was taking her down, 
and she was controlling her in the clinch as well, which isn't a good look when you're fighting someone like Claudia Gadella. But the question is, how much has her takedown defense improved? How much has her work in the clinch improved? She's been working at Team Alpha Male for this camp. And how much is Claudia going to wrestle? So, for me, on a, a, from a betting angle, I just don't really see any value on this fight. I think there's question marks with Yan. How, how is her takedown defense going to look now? How is she going to look off her back? And what approach is Claudia going to take here? The, the clear path to victory for her is to wrestle. But like I say, she's a lot more reluctant to, to overly wrestle these days. So I just don't know how much she's going to pursue it. Based on the line, I mean, Yang is actually getting bet. If the line came down and now it's going back out. Yang's basically minus 150, minus 155. If you're looking to bet Claudia... I would say I'd take a little bit now if I was you. If you want to bet her, she's plus 120, plus 125, plus 130. But I'd hold off. I think Yan might have a bit more money come in on her. I think you might even get a higher number on Claudia with the way the line's going. Um, so I'm going to pick Claudia here. I'm not confident. I'm not betting it personally because I can just see Claudia coming out and just striking far too much. And there is unknowns with Yan's takedown defence and how much it's improved. But Claudia does have a path to victory here. I think it's going to be a competitive fight either way. I think, you know, you're looking at a split decision, a 29-28 type fight. But I personally think the value is going with Claudia, especially if you can get that minus, uh, sorry, plus 130, plus 135. And it looks like Yan might get better a little bit more as well. So if you end up getting Claudia at plus 150... I think that's a good bet. I mean, you know Claudia will, you know, you know the dangers. She might slow down. And there's a, a, a potential very frustrating threat that she doesn't come out and wrestle nearly as much as she should here. But she is the more proven commodity. Yan, look, she's, she's very promising, but there's unknowns here. And, you know, who is her best win in the UFC? Probably Angela Hill in a fight for me that could have gone either way. Carolina, Condo, Pereira, Curran. I mean, Condo, Pereira, Curran aren't with the UFC anymore. Carolina's probably not. She's probably retiring. Angela Hill fight that could have gone either way. Claudia Gadella, you know, been in UFC a long time. Um, you know, tough girl to, to get a W again. She still only lost to um, Joanna twice Jessica Andraj and Nina Ansarov you know four of the of three of the top girls in the world is Jan one of them I don't know yet jury's still out for me so I think the line you know I don't trust Gadella just because I've had her on my favorites for a while just because of post Gisada she doesn't wrestle as much as she used to she thinks she's striker now um, she's taken a fair bit of damage as well Claudia, I mean, she did get dropped against Angela Hill. The, the, the damage is starting to pile up a little bit on her as well. The Andrade fight was, you know, it's quite difficult to watch that fight. But the way the odds are, I'm going to pick Gadella. But as I say, I definitely wouldn't go big. I'm not betting it personally, but I think the value is, is going towards Claudia. And if it does end up at being plus 150 or so, I definitely feel that's the, the right side. If, if Yang comes out here and wins a dominant 30-27, then fair play to her, um, but I just I just don't personally see it. Next fight on the card, we have Ian Heinish taking on Brendan Allen. Looking forward to this one. It's kind of been flicking around this fight. Brendan Allen was the favourite. It came in at a pick and Ian went favourite. Brendan's gone favourite again. Um, I'm not surprised it's yo-yo I think it's a, a very competitive fight. But I think this is an interesting fight stylistically for, for Brendan Allen because Brendan Allen is all about, he comes in, you know, there's, I've never seen him in a fight where he's forced to stand and fight long. It's, it's, it's quite bizarre. Um, every fight he wants to crash the distance, he wants to get to the body lock and he, he wants to try and take you down. He's he won in the contender series, got a nice knee from the tie plum. Uh, dropped Jeffrey and then managed to drop down and get the choke. Kevin Holland managed to choke out as well. Back and forth fight. He was on top. Nearly choked Holland out. Holland scrambled, got on top. Um, cut him up pretty bad. Nearly choked him out. 
it's taken down in round two. Holland's on top, and he scrambles on top of Holland and, and chokes him out. Tom Brees, Tom Brees tried to jump on his back when I was in the clinch and ended up on the bottom and got pounded out. And then the Cole Dawkers fight, very scramble heavy fight. Brendan managed to do enough to nick the, I think it was round one and two he won. Um, the round two he was, looked like it was going to go to Carl. Carl was on top, but then he ended up getting reversed and Brendan managed to nick the round back with a, about a minute remaining, I believe. So Brendan Allen is the kind of guy that he's he's always going to be in scramble heavy fights. I mean, even pre-UFC, you go and watch his fights. You watch his five rounder with Anthony Hernandez. Even the Tim Hiley, Tim Hilly, however you say that fight, I mean, he, he pretty much dominated that fight, but there was a period at the end of round one where he ends up on the bottom and mounted, and he might have been saved by the bell. Um, you know, he's he's someone that's very... He will either come out and put you away or get put away himself. Um, he's just one of them fighters. He's only young. He's only 24 years of age, so, you know, he, he should be improving, but he's just got... Just got a style where there's not there's, there's not really any structure to it. It's wham bam, thank you, ma'am. It comes out 100 miles an hour. I, I'd like to see him start to kind of put a bit more of a game plan together as opposed to just coming in, crushing the distance, trying to get the body lock, trying to drag it down to the mat. It's not going to work as you move up the levels in the UFC now. It, his UFC run's been quite kind to him stylistically. You know, guys like Kevin Holland would love a scramble fest. Tom Briggs. Tom Briggs is, you know, a flake. And, you know, what was Briggs doing? Trying to jump on his back. Ended up on the bottom. And Kyle Dorcas, another guy loves a scramble. And all guys physically, um, I know Tom Briggs is, is physically um, looks the part. But, you know, a guy like Brendan Allen can can do well with him in the clinch. I don't know if Briggs is as strong as he actually looks like he is. Because I remember the Nakamura fight. Nakamura was taking him down. Someone like Ian Heinish is a, is a brick wall, very physically strong guy. Ian is a bit wild on the feet, uh, you know, a bit of a overhand type guy. He's quite short. He has to get inside to land his shots, but very powerful. Um, now, he gives easy the body lock, um, which is Brendan Nolan's go-to thing, but he's very difficult to take down. Now, he's got a wrestling background. As I say, he's very physically strong. Um, he... You know, he can be taken down, don't get me wrong, but he's a very good scrambler. You go and watch his fights with Carlos Jr. and um, Mutante, and the guy always works to get back to his feet. Now, you know, he will give up his back and stuff, but it's it guys just seem to have difficulty managing to take his back. I know Carlos Jr. did, but he managed to survive and ride it out. Um, I know he got tapped pre-UFC by Perez, so a bit of a red flag there, but it was a pretty sweet submission that Perez hit on him. Very nice transition. But I, I think Ian's grown from that. And he is a difficult guy to sub and he's a difficult guy to control. And when you've got the body lock on him, he goes for the Granby roll. He's very good at it. Um, he's seen him do it in numerous fights. He does it very well. Um, and he can stuff takedowns in open space. I know Mutanti was hitting some explosive doubles on him, but Mutanti's got a great, great double. But like I said, he's hard to hold down. So... This fight reminds me of the um, Brendan Allen's fight of Eric Anders in the sense that he's fighting someone who's physically very strong. This is going to be a guy that I don't see Allen being able to go out and just clinch up with him, take him down when he wants, have a you know, scramble fest with him on the mat. I think Ian's going to be tough to take down. I think he's going to be tough for him to control. I think Ian will scramble back up to his feet. You know, Alan thrives for these scramble type situations and for Ian here the game plan should be to try and break away from the clinch. I've not got a problem with Ian actually taking Alan down. I'm not sure how good Alan is from the bottom. Like I said the team highly fight he nearly got finished. Um, Kevin Holland almost finished him when he was on top. Um, you know Kyle Dork has had some success when he was on top. But I think trying to keep Alan away from him and actually forcing Alan into a striking fight because we, we just don't see it from Alan and I, I don't think Alan's going to be comfortable there and Ian's going to be the bigger hitter. So for me, just in terms of the physical presence, physical strength that Ian brings to the table, I just think it makes this a, a difficult fight for Brendan Allen potentially. Um, and I'm going to pick Ian as the underdog here. Now, it's, it's a close fight. 
Um, but I think as an underdog, there's a little bit of value on here, and I think I'd I'd cap him a slight favourite here. You know, maybe 55, 45. As I said, Ian can be body locked. You watch his fights, and he ends up in that position a lot. But he's physically very strong. Um, he's a strong guy. He's I know he guessed against Brunson, but uh, that aside, he's got good cardio, and I think he will outlast Brendan Allen here in a scramble heavy fight, especially with the strength. I don't think Allen's really to face that physicality since since he fought Eric Anders. Um, and Derek Brunson and Amari beat him, but, you know, they're both very strong wrestlers. Ian wasn't able to take them down. Wasn't really able to enforce his game plan. Amari hits very hard. You could see that that made Ian a little bit hesitant. He, he kind of cracked Ian a few times. And against Derek Brunson, he just he had a good first round, but then he just slowed down, which... Still don't really know why, um, because he had them high-paced fights with Mutanti and Carlos Jr. Carlos Jr. though and Mutanti do slow down, so maybe that's why he's, he's maybe he did slow a bit in them fights, but it was disguised by the fact that they slow. And Amari again, um, Ian won round three against Amari, but Amari's another guy that slows down, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Brendan Allen slow down in this fight either, um, and, and Ian kind of take over. And I definitely favour him to win round three in that scenario, and then you know you need him to win round one or two to, to take the decision. So I'm going to pick Ian here um, because I just think he matches up well with with Brendan in the sense that I don't think Brendan's going to be able to come in and just overpower him. And the other thing to note is Brendan Allen's takedowns aren't very good. Um, his fights always end up on the mat, but I mean, if you look at his UFC run, I mean, I think he got one takedown on Kevin Holland, but Holland's quite easy to take down. He's not physically very strong. Um, Holland took him down um, in the second round. The Jeffrey fight, he dropped him with a knee from the tire plum, which is something Ian needs to be careful with because he's got a very good knee from the tire plum. I think he dropped or hurt Dorcas with one from the tire plum as well. Tom Brees tried to jump on his back from the clinch, and the Kyle Dorcas was. I don't think he hit a takedown on Dorcas. I think it was just, they was, I think Dorcas was taking him down and he would end up scrambling and getting on top. So, you know, it's not like he has great takedowns. So, I just think stylistically, if he ever fights smart here, this is a winnable fight for him. Next fight on the card, we have... Roni Barcelos taking on Khalid Taha. So Barcelos coming in on short notice here. It's a favourable fight for him. It's reflected in the line. Taha, he hits hard Taha. He does have big power for a bantamweight. Um, one of the hard in, harder, hitter, harder hitting bantamweights in the UFC. But as we've seen in the UFC, he's, his game is a bit flawed with regards to his defensive wrestling and getting up off of his back. Um, and Barcelos... Needs to be careful because he does like to strike Barcelos and, you know, he will trade in the pocket, but he's shown a solid chin in the UFC, um, taking some big shots, no problem, he's never been stopped, but he's got to be careful with Taha, but the, the path to victory here is the grappling, which we've seen him utilise in the UFC very well. I have to pick Barcelos here, I mean, there's not really any value on the line, he's up minus 350, um, but I just think there's a, there's a clear path to victory here and, you know... He's not outgunned. He's not outclassed on the on the feet. He might be outgunned, but Taha is the bigger hitter. But Barcelos is no mug on the feet either. So, but I just see Barcelos using his grappling here. If he fights smart, he used the grappling. Taha got grappled against um, Nadir Romani. No, it was short notice. Up at one forty-five. But Bruno Silva held him down for round two. Took the round off of him. So Barcelos, he needs to watch his P's and Q's, I think, but I think Taha, he has a, a puncher's chance. His only chance is to win by knockout, in my opinion. Andre Olofsky, Tanabosa next, heavyweight bouts. Tanabosa, you know, he's got a little bit of hype behind him there, Tanner. He's coming off a couple of wins. Um, I'm still not buying that he's a, he's a finisher at heavyweight. I mean, he, he came into the UFC and had this reputation of being someone that's not a finisher, you know, he... He kind of uses a lot of leg kicks, he fight at a distance, but he's got back-to-back -back knockout wins. Felipe Lindsay knocked out in round one. You know, I wasn't sold on Felipe's chin at all. Um, got knocked out a couple of times at light heavyweight, moving up to heavyweight, you know, and this should, you're cutting a lot of weight, and it was really 
jeopardizing your chin how's your chin going to look getting punched by heavyweight so i don't read too much into that and then the Pessoa fight was just a bit weird he got look the Bosa I'm not saying it was a flu Bosa threw the punch but it was it was like the fun that went in the eye you know sometimes you see this where fighters try and say it's a poke when it's not and Pessoa just kind of quit I mean I don't know what but I'm sure it was very painful but he, he just kind of gave up so I'm not buying into Bosa being this massive finishing threat <laughs> um, I don't think he is um, Andre Olovsky, as we know, has kind of reinvented himself numerous times now, and from being called the chinniest heavyweight in MMA, he's suddenly gone on a run of not being knocked out for a long time. Obviously, Rosenstrike did, but first time he'd been knocked out since when he faced Francis and Garnu, and at the end of the day, who doesn't, who doesn't Francis knock out? He's coming off a win over Felipe Linz. I bet Olofsky there. I thought the line was too wide. I thought Felipe was getting overrated. Um, you know, people say it's a controversial decision, but I don't think it was a bad decision. It was a close competitive fight. Tanner Bosa, yeah, he's the minus 300 favourite here. I mean, a bit wide for me. But, you know, the speed of Bosa is probably going to cause problems for Olofsky. Bosa's going to be kicking him from the outside. We know what Olofsky likes to do. He likes to try and explode in and catch you, but I don't think Bosa's really going to give him the the counter opportunities here. I think he's just going to kick long. I, I see it going the distance. I mean, we've said that about Bosa's last couple, but I do see this one going the distance. I think he will fight long. He kick heavy approach that he normally uses, and I think he... He kind of cruises to a, uh, not cruises, but I think he wins a decision. But the line's too wide for me. I mean, I am going to pick Bosa here. I'm not going to go against my gut because I think Bosa has looked good in the UFC, especially his last couple of fights, and he's looked a lot different physically as well um, as opposed to his, his pre-UFC run. He looks in real good shape now. Like he's kind of taking this real serious now. So, you know, he's the younger guy. I, I expect him to go out and win a, a decision here, but... I'm not paying the juice on a, a heavyweight fight minus 300, and, and it's not like Bosa is an elite heavyweight. I wouldn't be surprised if this ends up being a close fight, but I do ultimately have to side with Bosa here. Um, his decision line is probably minus money, so I wouldn't want to get involved with that. Let's have a quick look. Bosa KO plus 160. See, that would have been, you know, if he didn't have that knockout loss in that, uh, knockout win in his last fight, that'd probably be like plus 400. Um, so, where is it? Post a decision. So, you post a decision there is plus money. Like, you're looking at plus 160 or so. Um, whereas, before that Pessoa fight, this would probably be like minus 125. So, you know, it's heavyweight. One punch can change everything, so I don't think there's massive, massive value there, but plus 160, I don't think is a bad bet if you're one of these guys that like your sweats, um, you like to bet every fight. I think you could do worse than take Bosa by decision there. Fight goes to decision is, so it's minus money, so I think it's worth, you know, for the extra, like, 1.3 points, I think it's worth, is it 1.3? No, two, like, 0.9 points, I think it's worth taking the Bosa decision line as opposed to fight goes to decision, or if you just want to be careful, you could, you know, split it, put half on fight goes to decision, half on Bosa decision, but I am going to pick, I am going to pick Bosa there, even though money line's too wide, but if I was going to look at anything, it would be the decision line. Main event, Glover Teixeira taking on Thiago Santos, so Thiago's coming back off of the uh, a very close John Jones loss, which a lot of people score for Thiago. Oblique kicks though ruined Thiago's knees in that fight. He was in a bad, bad way. He had to have surgery. I think it was on both knees. I remember seeing some videos of him and like he literally couldn't walk. He was on crutches. His legs were heavily casted. Um, looked a right mess. But I don't like to play doctor. I have to assume he's back 100%. When I'm looking at it from a betting perspective, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at it as I'm expect especially if I'm looking to bet against Diago, I'm definitely gonna look at 
how is this fight going to look if we get Thiago at 100%? Um, I mean, he's getting up there in age now, Thiago. He's 36 years of age. He'll be 37 in January. But he's been looking real good at light heavyweight. You um, had the Eric Anders fight. Now, the Eric Anders fight is the most relevant fight to look at with regards to this fight with Glover. Um, got a nice knockout over Jimmy Manaway. Got a knockout over Yan. And then, as I say, he could have had a W over John Jones. But the Eric Anders fight, stylistically, is probably the fight to look at here because Glover is not going to win on the feet. You know, everyone's been fading Glover for, for a few years now because he, he is very slow and robotic on the feet now. Um, I mean, he's never been quick, but you can clearly see he's, he's got slower on the feet. He's easier to hit than he was. He is a liability on the feet. That is without a shadow of a doubt. He's still tough. He can still take a shot, but... He, you know, if this fight stays on the feet, he's in, he's in all sorts of bother. Um, he's going to be trying to take Thiago down. And if you watch Eric Anders' fight, Thiago's takedown defence is not great. Um, I'm also not sold on how good he is from the bottom either. Eric Anders is a, a strong physical guy, but Glover is a different level grappler. Um, if, Glover, if Glover gets on top of you, that could spell trouble. And the approach Anders brought in that fight as well, where it was wrestle heavy. I mean, he had to survive, don't get me wrong, on the feet. You know, there were some moments where it looked like he was going to get taken out before he actually did. But, you know, he, he he survived those moments and he kept taking the fight to the floor. Thiago kept getting back up. But Thiago was really tired now. Anders took that fight very short notice. I think he took the week of the fight. And Anders clearly gassed worse than Thiago. And ultimately, he well, it was elbows in the end. I mean, I think... He was, he was trying to take Santos down against the cage and, and Santos basically elbowed him. But it was a very competitive fight up until that point and both were blowing. That was Thiago's first fight at 205. Maybe Thiago was kind of getting used to his body fighting at 205 or whatever he weighed by fight time, 225 maybe. So maybe he's adjusted now. He's had three fights, but they haven't been high-paced fights like the Anders fight. So Glover for me has to come out here. He's he's going to have to survive some difficult moments on the feet. It's just can he get the takedowns early on Thiago to get those periods where he can get some rest away from away from the strikes and where he can make Thiago work and start to slow him down. Um, I don't love the line on Thiago. I've got to admit, but. It's tough to pick against him here. Um, it could definitely get interesting the longer the fight goes. If if Glove can get through the first couple of rounds and in those first two rounds can have some success with takedowns, make Thiago work. Thiago starts to slow down. You know, we saw it in the in his last fight, Glove, where he was getting picked apart on the feet the first couple of rounds. But um, uh, Smith started to slow down and Glover took over. But... It's it's a bigger ask to survive those first couple of rounds against Thiago, but Glover's durable. He's not he's not chinny, but uh, like I said, he is slow and hittable. That's the problem for him. Um, he's forty one years of age, and he does you know he does get rocked a lot. Carl Robertson elbowed him, I had him rocked. Chris Lava. Dropped him with a spinning back fist. But I've just got to pick Thiago here. I can't, you know, I bet Glover against Anthony Smith. But here I'm just not so sure. Um, if we get Thiago at 100%, and I have to assume he's going to be, I just think he's going to be too much. I can just see him putting, putting Glover away. Um... But you've got to remember, Thiago can pull a stunt. You know, David Branch knocked him out. I mean, this was down at middleweight, but David Branch knocked him out. Um, Eric Spicely choked him out. You know, he, he's he has been known to pull a stunt or two, Thiago Santos. So I wouldn't be shocked if Glover pulled this out of the bag. But I'm not betting him. I don't. I don't like the line. I don't think there's any value on it because Glover's just one of those guys. It's easy to underrate him. He looks slow and old on the feet, but man, he's a dog. Um, he's tough. He's got heart, and he's got a very good ground game for a light heavyweight. 
and you know his wrestling is not too bad either. Uh, and Tiago isn't the best defender of takedowns. But ultimately, I'm going to pick Tiago. But from a live betting perspective, I'll be very interested to see how Tiago is looking as we if we get into the the second and third rounds and kind of what success club has had with the takedowns has he made him work does Tiago look like he's slowing down but make no mistake on the feet it's it's Tiago all day but I, I'm going to pick I'm going to pick Tiago but I'm a little bit tentative with it I don't love the line and Glover is a guy that we all like to count out but the guy comes through as a dog time and time again so would not shock me if he, he pulled this off again and like I said Tiago has been known to pull a stunt in his time so that wraps up the card, guys. Good luck with all your bets. As I say, ProMMABetting.com if you want to look at the betting packages. All bets are tracked. Links to the trackers below. They're also on the website. I'll be back next week to break down the next UFC card. Good luck, everyone.